It's my pleasure tonight to introduce our first speaker in our, in our guest speaker series, Dr. Gordon Edwards. He had graduated from the University of Toronto in 1961 with a gold medal in mathematics and physics and a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship. In 1972, he obtained a PhD in mathematics from Queen's University. From 1970 to 74, he was the editor of Survival Magazine. And in 1975, he co-founded the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility and has been his president since 1978. Edwards has worked widely as a consultant on nuclear issues and is qualified as a nuclear expert by courts in Canada and elsewhere. Dr. Edwards has written articles and reports on radiation standards, radioactive wastes, uranium mining, nuclear proliferation, the economics of nuclear power, non-nuclear energy strategies. He has been featured on radio and television programs, including David Suzuki, The Nature of Things, Pierre Burton's The Great Debate, and many others. He has worked as a consultant for governmental bodies, such as the Auditor General of Canada, the Select Committee on Ontario Hydro Affairs, and the Ontario Royal Commission on Electric Power Planning. In 2006, Dr. Edwards received the Nuclear Free Future Award. He is a retired teacher of mathematics at Vanier College in Montreal. If I could bring up Dr. Edwards. I'll just make sure you take that. <coughs> Can you launch it for me? Well, hello everybody. Thank you so much. And I wish to thank especially the uh, Citizens Liaison Committee. Congratulations for embarking upon this educational process. I think it's very important. <coughs> It's a big question, as you know. It's a question which has uh, puzzled people around the world, on this continent and other continents. And it's not a simple one. It's not, it has no simple answers. It's not a question of yes, no. It's a question of what is best. What is best for this community? What is best for uh, the country as a whole? What is best for the planet, really? So uh, thank, you, thank you all for turning out tonight as well. I'm going to be uh, covering a good deal of material because there are so many aspects. This is like a multi-dimensional thing that you have to look at from different points of view. And there's only so much you can say in an hour, and there's only so much you can hear in an hour. Um, so if I ever get a chance to come back, I would like to pursue some, some of these other aspects as well. So let's get started. Uh, oh, yes, there we go. Well. The situation here is that the nuclear power industry in Canada has produced 3 million bundles of nuclear fuel waste to date, weighing over 50,000 tons. They expect to double this in the next 30 years. And uh, there's a picture there of a can-do fuel bundle. It's about the size of a fireplace log. And before it goes into the reactor, uh, you could handle it much the way you handle a fireplace log, as long as you wear gloves. Um, However, once it comes out of the reactor, it's deadly dangerous and will remain so for an awfully long time, millions of years, in fact. Um, <clears throat> there's wet storage, which takes place for 10 years. Uh, that's because if you don't continually circulate water past the spent fuel bundles, they will overheat spontaneously and damage themselves and release radioactivity into the uh, environment into the atmosphere and uh, into the water. So that's why they have to be cooled for about 10 years. They can be put into dry storage, which still requires a certain amount of cooling, but uh, that cooling is not as intense because the heat generation has gone down. And then we've got more being produced every day. So let's begin with the word nuclear. What is nuclear? Uh, why do we use this word? Basically, a simple answer is nuclear energy is energy that comes from the nucleus, the nucleus being the core of an atom. Every atom has a tiny core called the nucleus, very massive, and it's surrounded by one or more orbiting electrons. These electrons are negatively charged, and the nucleus itself is positively charged. Now, chemical energy involves only the outer electrons. So every chemical reaction you've ever seen portrayed on television, big explosions, uh, tanks firing things, or cooking in the kitchen, all the changes that take place, all the industrial changes that take place in chemical plants, all of it involves only the electrons. It doesn't involve the nucleus. Nuclear energy is energy that comes directly from the nucleus. And it is typically millions of times more powerful than any chemical energy. 
And that's why it's rather difficult sometimes to grasp the scale of nuclear energy because things which are extremely tiny can be giving off an incredible amount of energy. There are two types of nuclear energy in particular to discriminate between. And the first one is called nuclear fission. And that's the splitting of uranium atoms, for example. That's what really gives the juice in a can-do nuclear reactor. That's what really produces the bulk of the heat that's used to produce steam to generate electricity. But there's another form of nuclear energy, radiation, radioactivity specifically. Now, it's very important to understand that these are different things. Nuclear fission is a process which can be controlled. It can be speeded up, it can be slowed down, it can be stopped, it can be started. Radioactivity cannot be controlled that way. Nobody knows how to speed it up, how to slow it down, how to stop it. You can't shut it off. And that's why we have a nuclear waste problem. Because this radioactivity, enormous amounts of radioactivity, cannot be shut off. And that, there's the problem in a nutshell. Nobody knows what to do about it. Although some people think they have an answer, uh, we're not sure if that answer is correct or not. Here's a model of the uranium atom. Canada is one of the world's largest exporters and producers of uranium. In fact, we produced some of the uranium for the first atomic bombs uh, that ended World War II. Uranium is very special. It's the key element behind all nuclear fission technology. So you can't have nuclear fission technology without having uranium lurking in the background or in the foreground. These photographs, by the way, are from a colleague of mine who was the founder of the Atomic Photographers Guild, which has photographers in 13 different countries that have uh, undertaken the job of documenting the nuclear age through photographs. This is a picture of a Russian monument. The Soviets were very good at building these monuments. And uh, this is a monument to the splitting of the atom. And uh, the man in the foreground is Kurchatov, who was the father of the Soviet atomic bomb. And uh, that sculpture, you see those two hemispheres. Those are the broken pieces of a uranium atom just at the moment of being split. And those semicircles surrounding the hemispheres represent, symbolize the energy that's released, tremendous amount of energy. Um, the important thing to notice here is those two pieces of the uranium atom are new, new nuclei. They're the nucleus of new atoms, and they're called the fission products. And there are hundreds of different fission products which are created by chopping up those uranium atoms. So when you hear words like cesium-137 and iodine-131 and krypton-85, if you heard these kind of words, you might wonder, what the heck are they? Well, actually, they're all broken pieces of uranium atoms in most cases. There are a few other uh, types of radioactive materials which are not created in this way, but in a different way. This is an ad from the Canadian Nuclear Association. It's called Small Wonder. And the reason the word small wonder is used is because the gentleman who's holding up a fuel pellet, a typical uranium fuel pellet, probably a fake, um, he's saying, isn't it amazing that this little fuel pellet would give as much energy as a ton of coal? And that, in fact, is the real attraction of nuclear energy. The energy is so concentrated. And of course, another attraction of nuclear energy is the fact that it doesn't produce the CO2, the combustion that uh, you get when you burn fossil fuels. So it has certainly advantages, and that's why people have uh, invested in nuclear power and developed nuclear power. But what the ad doesn't say is that those fuel bundles which are in front of him there, just one of those fuel bundles would be able to kill him in 20 seconds if instead of being a fresh fuel bundle, it was a used fuel bundle. The amazing thing is that when the fuel bundle goes into the reactor, it's not very radioactive. But when it comes out of the reactor, it would kill any human being in less than 20 seconds. I don't mean that they would drop down dead in 20 seconds. It would take them a few days to die. But it would give them a lethal dose of radiation. And in fact, those fuel bundles, when they come out of the reactor, will never be handled by human hands again. They'll be handled robotically. Here's a man standing in front of the face of a Kandu reactor. That's the core. That's called the core of the reactor. It's a horizontal core in the Kandu system. 
And there's all those fuel channels. And inside those fuel channels, there are uh, those fuel bundles stuck inside. And what happens, the reason he's able to stand there is because this reactor has never operated yet. If this reactor had operated even for a short time, he couldn't stand there because he'd be getting uh, uh, an intolerable dose of radi radiation. Um, once those fuel bundles, uh, once the reactor is turned on, the uranium atoms begin to be fissioned and then the, the energy is released, steam is generated, electricity is produced, and we also produce um, nuclear waste. Now, the funny thing is that the electricity is produced for how long? Well, maybe 30 years, maybe 40 years, if you're lucky. But the nuclear waste will be there forever. So actually, you could think of it that what the nuclear reactor really produces is nuclear waste. And what it produces is, as a short little byproduct, is electricity. So it's producing a lot of nuclear waste and a period of electricity at the beginning. When we spent fuel, when the used fuel comes out of the reactor, it's so radioactive that it can't be stored without very active cooling. That's why it has to be put in a deep pool. This is called a spent fuel pool. And they put the fuel down there, the used fuel, and in circulating water for about 10 years. You might say, wow, I mean, is it that hot? Let me explain. It's not so much that it's that hot as that it is generating heat. There's a difference between temperature and heat. Uh, You've heard about people, of course, who, unfortunately, uh, children, animals who die in cars that had the windows rolled up. And why is that? It's because the car turns into an oven, because the energy is coming in through the windows and it's not going out. So the temperature goes up. If you add heat, temperature goes up. And that's what these spent fuel bundles do. They add heat. They generate heat. And if that heat is not removed, you have overheating. The temperature will go up and up and up. So when was used nuclear fuel recognized as a problem? Well, this is a kind of a sad story because it took 30 years in Canada before the decision makers or the public were really informed that this was a problem. Um, in fact, we started producing used fuel, irradiated nuclear fuel, back in 1945. That's when the first nuclear reactor started operating in Canada. And 45, 55, 65, 75, there was never any official acknowledgement that this was a problem. In fact, when I first became involved in this issue, uh, people from the nuclear industry who shared panels with me where we were having, you know, a panel discussion, they would say, Mr. Edwards, nuclear power is not, uh, nuclear waste is not a technical problem, it's only a public relations problem. They tended to look at the problem as being really just a question of digging a hole somewhere, putting it down there, and walking away. And uh, it was regarded as a fairly trivial problem. What it really came down to, I think, is that they thought, well, that's not really my job. My job is to get the reactors working. My job is to keep things safely operating. My job is to look at the bottom line. I'm not the garbage man. I'm not the one who has to take out the garbage. Somebody else will look after that. Well, it is a big, big problem. In fact, it's an unprecedented problem. One of the greatest, I believe, one of the greatest unsolved problems that the human race is facing. Now. Um, so, in 1977, finally, there was a federal report called the Hare Report, called Managing Canada's Nuclear Waste, and that's the first time that the recommendation was made in print to have a deep geological repository in granite rock. This is without any research having been done at all up to that point. So, it was purely a conceptual thing. Let's dig a hole in the granite, let's put the waste down there, and if we can find a place where there's an undisturbed geological formation, which has been undisturbed for hundreds of millions of years, then surely it's going to remain undisturbed for hundreds more millions of years. And so if we put the waste down there, it's going to be safe. And uh, it was that simple, really. Uh, but it's not that simple. 
So Brian Flowers, who was a nuclear physicist, a famous nuclear physicist in Britain, he worked on both the British nuclear power program and the British nuclear weapons program. He conducted a Royal Commission inquiry into nuclear power and the environment way back around that time, 1976. And uh, one, of his, one of the conclusions of his report was that it would be irresponsible and morally wrong to keep producing this waste unless we really have a solution for it, unless we have a genuine solution for it. So what this said, basically, is we should not keep producing nuclear power if we can't solve the problem. Now that was a clear signal to the nuclear industry that their future is at stake. If they don't solve this problem, no more nuclear power. This was re repeated in the United States around the same time in 1977. The growth of nuclear power in the United States is threatened by the problem of how to safely dispose of this waste. A solution to the disposal problem is critical to the continued growth of nuclear energy. So this is important because it means that people in the nuclear industry see this as a threat to their livelihood, their careers, and their favorite technology. And therefore, if you want to continue with nuclear power, you got to make it, got to solve this problem or at least convince people that it is solved. The Porter Commission, this was the Ontario Royal Commission on Electric Power Planning. In 1978, they said, continuous monitoring of waste disposal research should be undertaken by an independent panel of experts. Now, that word independent is important because they recognize that there's a, con there's a conflict of interest. If you ask the nuclear industry to decide on this, then um, they have a public relations problem and actually a survival problem. So how can they sort of judge whether or not a given uh, solution is adequate or not because they're in a conflict of interest? So it's important to have an independent panel. Nuclear power should be reassessed and a moratorium on additional nuclear stations should be considered if this problem is not well in hand by 1985. The Select Committee on Ontario Hydro Affairs, which is an all-party committee of the Ontario Legislature, they had 15 weeks of hearings on uh, nuclear waste, nuclear reactor safety, and the uranium industry, all three topics. And they published three reports, one on each of them. The safety of Ontario's nuclear reactors, the management of Ontario's nuclear waste, and uh, I forget the title of the other one, but it was about the uranium processing. And they said that continuous, uh, excuse me, I've got the wrong quote there. That's the quote from the... Uh, Royal Commission, excuse me. But they, they came up with the same, similar kind of conclusion. They said that what we need is a group of people who are independent of the industry and the regulator who can only be interested in representing the public interest. So when we go look at the next 25 years after that, uh, we find that uh, $750 million was spent in a 15-year research effort in Manitoba to uh, build an underground research laboratory and study the granite formations. During this process, the Manitoba government passed a law saying that they would never allow the permanent disposal of nuclear waste in the province of Manitoba. Um, and the reason for this was because of uh, repeated questioning from citizens groups. And they did get written assurances that there would be no actual nuclear waste put down into this repository. But they said, well, th those papers are not legally binding. We need a legally binding thing. So uh, they needed a law, and that's what they got. They got a law. That law is on the books. Um, in Quebec, they have also uh, taken a very strong stand. Uh, the, premier, the Premier Barassa, one of the previous premiers of Quebec, declared that he would never allow a permanent storage place for nuclear waste from other jurisdictions in the province of Quebec or on its boundaries. And uh, in fact, uh, just, re just in the last couple of years, the Quebec Legislature, National Assembly, has passed a unanimous resolution to the same effect. So a couple of provinces, and, and incidentally, it's, it's kind of interesting. The only provinces that are in the running, really, are Ontario, which makes sense, because Ontario is the main producer of nuclear waste. But it's kind of ironic that we have communities in the north of Ontario which have not really got the benefits of nuclear power. The benefits have mostly been in the south. So why is it that they get the benefits and, and the north gets the waste? Well, of course, there will be benefits in terms of economic activity and so on, which are not to be sneezed at.
But uh, nevertheless, there's a certain kind of question lurking there. Um, now, there was a 10-year environmental assessment on this called the Seaborne Panel, and the unanimous recommendation of the Seaborne Panel was that there had to be an independent waste management agency, independent of the nuclear industry. That's not what the government did, though. The government set up the NWMO, uh, which is actually set up by the nuclear waste producers, the three utilities that produce nuclear waste, uh, Ontario Power Generation, New Brunswick Power Corporation, and Hydro-Quebec. Even though we've now shut down the only reactor operating in Quebec, so we're no longer producing more nuclear waste, nevertheless, we did produce quite a, quite a, a lot of it previously. So, uh, contrary to what the Seaborne panel recommended, uh, we've got a national a nuclear waste organization which really does, uh, is not independent of the nuclear waste producers. And that may pose some questions of uh, how do you deal with a conflictual situation. To give you an example, in Assa, Germany, uh, there was an old salt mine, and years ago, back in the 60s, they started uh, thinking that this would be a very good place to put nuclear waste, not the high-level nuclear waste that we're talking about here, but less radioactive waste. And so they started putting that stuff down into this abandoned salt mine as a deep geological repository for lower-level radioactive waste. Well, it's recently come to light that that mine is leaking and has been leaking for quite a long time. In fact, it was leaking for almost 10 years, radioactivity that is, leaking radioactivity. It was leaking for about 10 years before anybody told the authorities about it. And the reason nobody told the authorities is because of a, it's a public relations problem. If you say the mine is leaking, then uh, that does not look good for the nuclear industry. So there's a real problem here of, uh, of ensuring that the people who are doing this work are truly independent of the waste producers, and they don't have anything to fear from uh, uh, giving complete, being completely upfront. Um, there was also, I, I, uh, well, I, I'll just mention another example. There was recently uh, an incident that came to light during hearings that were held down in Concordia that I attended. Uh, dealing with another DGR, another proposed DGR, Deep Geological Repository, for not as radioactive waste as these ones that we're talking about here, but less radioactive waste, a low and intermediate level waste. And during the course of the hearings, it came to light that a similar type of repository in Carlsbad, New Mexico, had an accident last year where one of the waste drums underground, 700 meters underground, exploded. And even though it was 700 meters underground and they had ventilation systems in the shafts and so on and filters, nevertheless, this radioactive dust found its way to the surface and contaminated 22 workers and also drifted downwind and lightly contaminated a town downwind. And they've now said that this, this waste repository will not be allowed to be reopened until 2018 to to be back into functionality. The reason being that the passageways are contaminated with this radioactive dust. So what I'm saying here is not that that's what's going to happen here. It's an entirely different type of proposal here. It's an entirely different kind of waste here. All I'm saying is it's really important to realize that mistakes happen and that when mistakes happen, people are prepared to be perfectly upfront and honest about it and surprises happen. They, they, they're not sure exactly what happened, why this waste drum exploded, but they think it was because of kitty litter. There was kitty litter that was used as a packing material. You know, like you use Excelsior when you mail a big bulky package? Well, they use kitty litter. And what radioactivity does, I didn't tell you what radioactivity is, did I? Radioactivity refers to the fact that some atoms have nuclei which are unstable, and so they suddenly and violently disintegrate. Phew! They, like popcorn, pew, chew, chew. And uh, every time one of these disintegrations take place, you get a burst of uh, energy and particles released that can damage the surrounding material and can cause chemical reactions to happen. So nuclear waste will, is active. It's not inert. It's active. It's radioactive. It's thermally active, meaning it generates heat. 
and it's chemically active. It promotes chemical reactions. And they believe that the, the radioactivity caused chemical reactions in the kitty litter, which caused a buildup of gas inside the uh, container and led to the explosion and the release of that dust. We're not sure if that's actually the truth because I haven't recovered that canister yet. So now I'd like to ask a, a very serious question here, and that is, let's be perfectly frank about the question of whether the geological storage problem idea can, in fact, save uh, sto solve the waste problem. What is the problem? What really is the problem? I mean, right now, it's being safely stored where it is. We know that. The industry tells us that. The NWMO tells us that. And they also say we could safely store it there for quite a long time, you know, 100 years, 200 years. Uh, we would have to change the containers. It's written down in the NWMO's first report. They describe how you could have complete ongoing storage on the site without moving it anywhere. So that being the case, the question is, why should you move it from point A to point B if you don't know for sure that it's going to be any safer at point B than it was at point A? Uh, that's, that's a serious question. Another question, then, is what is the problem you're trying to solve? Is the problem to try and get the waste all underground so that there's no waste above ground that would be susceptible to attack or to the elements? So the question is, can geological storage possibly solve the waste disposal problem? Take a look at this graphic that I made, very simplistic graphic because I don't have uh, the animation skills of Walt Disney. Uh, that X represents a nuclear reactor and those two dots represent, each dot represents one year of nuclear fuel waste. So after two years, we have two, two dots. After four years, we have four dots. I'm a mathematician. I'm good at this stuff. After eight years, we have eight dots. And so the nuclear waste builds up beside the reactor. And without geological disposal, you could say, well, there's all that nuclear waste sitting right there on the surface. This is dangerous. We shouldn't allow this. We should actually try and get it out of there, put it underground, somewhere up here maybe. Um, well, let's see what it looks like with geological disposal. So here it is with geological disposal. After two years, there's no difference. Why? Because you have to have it in the pool. You can't take it out of the pool. After four years, it's still got to stay in the pool. After six years, after eight years, still got to stay in the pool. It's actually only until you get at least after 10 years that you can even consider moving it underground, correct? So that means you haven't really solved the problem at all. Even if you were able to put that older waste, the stuff in the box around it, even if you put that older waste into a geological repository instantly, and by the way, the NWMO now says it takes a lot more than 10 years. They're expecting to wait for 30 years before they put the waste in a repository. So you're going to have 30 years worth of waste at that reactor site, and that's going to continue as long as that reactor keeps operating. So as long as that reactor keeps operating, you're never going to get rid of the nuclear waste on site at the reactor site. What you've done instead is you've now created two sites which both have nuclear waste in them. The reactor site still has a lot of stuff that can go wrong, and the other place where it's going to has a lot of stuff which can go wrong. And you've also got the transportation of the waste along the highways, which could also go wrong. So have you solved the problem, or have you just complicated the problem? Now, the nuclear industry hopes to be able to establish geological disposal because that will give them the green light to go ahead and build more reactors. So let's suppose we build another reactor. Well, the same thing happens with the second reactor that happened to the first one, right? What happens if you have four reactors, eight reactors, six reactors, eight reactors? Well, the fact of the matter is that the more reactors you build, the larger the inventory of unburied radioactive waste you are going to have at the surface, no matter how fast you put the stuff underground. Because you can't move it for 10, 20, or 30 years. And therefore, you have not solved the problem. So uh, our belief, that my organization is the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility, we believe that the responsible position to take here is that we really don't have a solution to this problem at the present time. And in fact, this problem is not really solvable as long as you keep producing the waste. 
And especially as long as you keep building more and more reactors, it's not going to be solvable. So the only thing that would make sense would be uh, that if the time comes, and it may be coming sooner than was once thought, where the reactors are shut down and phased out, if you then wait until the fresh spent fuel, if you wait about 10 years until all that stuff can be taken out of the pool, then you have a genuine chance of maybe moving it to a safer location. You'd still have to debate whether it really is safer or not. But at least you would have an honest approach. Uh, the problem is that a lot of the talk about waste disposal is not entirely honest in looking at the grand picture of things because it doesn't really offer a solution in the context of ongoing nuclear power production. So why is nuclear waste dangerous? Well, the fission process, the splitting of the atoms, as I explained before, creates hundreds of kinds of radioactive materials as unwanted byproducts. Most of these did not exist in nature before 1940. They're brand new things that were created inside the nuclear reactor. This incredibly complex mixture of radionuclides found in nuclear fuel waste is called high-level waste. And high-level waste can either be solid or it can be liquid because in some countries, for weapons purposes, they have dissolved the solid waste in nitric acid and put it into a liquid form. This is a very messy operation, very polluting. It's called reprocessing. And the reason they do that is because they want to get a valuable material out of this spent fuel, the irradiated fuel, a man-made material called plutonium. And the bomb makers wanted the plutonium for bombs, but civilian people want it for nuclear fuel. They know we're eventually going to run out of uranium sooner than people think. If we're going to get thousands of reactors going, it's really going to be a, a drain on the uranium supply. They're going to have to start using plutonium. That means they're going to have to liquefy that solid waste. And guess where they're going to do it? Wherever the waste is. If they move the waste to a community for geological disposal, they're not going to move it again to another place if they want to reprocess it. They will reprocess it where the waste is. And therefore, it's very important that citizens explore and understand what this reprocessing option is all about before they make any decision about whether they want the waste at all to come to their community. Now, of course, the Nuclear Waste Management Organization says, quite rightly, that there's no economic incentive to do this right now, and there's no plan to do this right now, and that is true. However, the people in the nuclear industry are very eager to do this eventually. And you can wait. You can be patient. Just wait until all the waste is in one place. That's the time to make a pitch for reprocessing. And I believe that pitch is inevitably going to come. So there are really three categories of nuclear waste materials. I mentioned the fission products, which are the broken pieces of uranium atoms. There's also things called activation products. These are actually non-radioactive atoms that are struck by a neutron and become radioactive, things that were not previously radioactive, but they have now become radioactive. We say they have been activated. Cobalt-60 is an example of this. If you, use, if you take a sample of steel, ordinary stainless steel, it has a certain impurity of cobalt-59 in it. And the cobalt-59 absorbs a neutron and becomes highly radioactive cobalt-60. That's why the very structures of the nuclear reactor become radioactive. And they become radioactive waste. When they take the spent fuel out of the reactor, the reactor itself is radioactive waste. They have to take it apart, and the steel, the stainless steel and all the structural materials that are in the core area of the reactor, they'll never be reused again. They'll be buried as radioactive waste. That's another kind of radioactive waste. That might also come to the geological repository here, depending on how lucky they are at getting it at Concarden, because right now they're trying to get the Concarden people to accept that, but that's not decided as to whether they'll get it or not. So I think that people have a right to know these things. And therefore, I think you need to have an agency that is going to explain exactly what's going on and explain what these wastes are and where they might go and where they might not go and what problems they may or may not cause in the future. Because nothing is fixed in cast in bronze. Just because you have a plan today doesn't mean that plan can't be changed uh, tomorrow or 10 years from now. 
Uh, there's also another thing that is created inside the reactor. They're called the transuranics. And there's about 36 of these. Uh, the transuranics are elements which are heavier than uranium, uranium being the heaviest naturally occurring element in, in the world. So uranium is called element number 92. The elements are ranged from 1 to 92. Element 92 is uranium. And that's the end of the line. But we've created now element 93, 94, 95, 96, 97. We've created these new elements. And plutonium is one of those. And these new elements, generally speaking, have very, very long half-lives. That means they last an awfully long time. Plutonium, for example, has a half-life of 24,000 years and is very, very toxic, as well as being a material that's used for atomic bombs. Um, but you might say, well, 24,000 years, it means if you're patient and you just wait for, let's say, 10 times that amount, 240,000 years, the plutonium should be all gone. So you just have to be a little patient. However, what they don't tell you either, and maybe they don't even know, is that plutonium-239, when it, when it disintegrates, it turns into uranium-235, which has a half-life of more than 600 million years. So what before had a half-life of 24,000 years turns into a new material which has a half-life of six or 700 million years. Well, <laughs> you can see that this is a complicated problem, yes? Right? This is a problem. And uh, it's to get these transuranics out, particularly the plutonium that they talk about reprocessing. Now here's a list of some of the radionuclides in irradiated nuclear fuel. This comes from Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, the Manitoba uh, White Shell Laboratories. And I had to get this list. It's not easy to get these lists. You've got to browbeat them. But uh, take a look at this list here. I'm sure you'll be able to absorb all these elements palladium, ruthenium, molybdenum, uh, cadmium, indium, but they're all, these are all radioactive forms of these things. And there's a whole bunch of them, tellurium, antimony, cesium, promethium, samarium, iridium, tungsten, lutetium, I bet you didn't know about lutetium. And uh, there it goes, and there's 211 of these in this list, and Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, and by the way, this is a list of radionuclides in spent can-do fuel after 10 years of cooling. Before 10 years of cooling, there's a lot more, but even this list is not complete. They, they say at the end of the report, this list is not complete. Um, in fact, I don't think they really know all of the fission products that exist. I've been told by knowledgeable people that there may be as many as 1,000 different fission products. And here's the thing that I want you to think about, because it's important to think about what can go wrong. If this stuff leaks into the environment, it's not just a question of having mercury leaking into the environment. At least you know it's mercury and you know what to look for, right? If this stuff leaks into the environment, you don't even know what to look for. Because there's so many different, different elements and they all have different chemical properties. They all have different pathways through the environment and they all have different pathways through the human body. Some of them concentrate in some organs. Some of them concentrate in other organs. Some of them do not concentrate at all, but they just go right through. Um, they all behave differently. Now, here's a graph from the 1978 report of the Ontario Royal Commission on Electric Power Planning called <coughs> A Race Against Time, a beautiful title, I believe, and it's about nuclear power. It's about nuclear power in Ontario. And uh, this graph shows the toxicity of one year's worth of can-do fuel from one can-do reactor over a period of 10 million years. The scale on the bottom is the time scale, and it goes from one year to 10 million years. Uh, when they put the little seven above the 10 over there on the right at the bottom, that means you have seven zeros, right? So it's like a one with seven zeros after it. That's 10 million. And if you look up at the top, you see that number up at the top there, like 10 to the 13, 10 with the power 13 up there. That means a, ten, a one with 13 zeros after it. That's basically 10 million million, 10 million million. And what is it referring to? It's referring to cubic meters of water. It's saying that you'd need 10 million million cubic meters of water to dissolve this waste to the level which is the maximum contamination level allowed by law. 
that if you wanted to dissolve it down to the maximum level of contamination allowed by law, you'd need 10 million million cubic meters. It turns out, you can go to the internet and check this out, that's almost exactly equal to the volume of Lake Superior. Now, you'll notice on this graph there are two lines, a red line and a blue line. Actually, the graph, if you go to the report, you'll find there are many more lines. <laughs> but those two lines, the blue line represents the total toxicity of the high-level waste. And you'll notice that it, it, it pretty well follows the red line until about, that's about um, less than 1,000 years, about 500 years. So up to about the first 500 years, most of the toxicity is from those fission products. After 500 years, the fission products drop way down. And the reason that happens is because so many of them have disintegrated that they're not there anymore. Okay? But the blue line takes over, and the blue line is the other things, the activation products, but most particularly the transuranics. So the main reason why the blue line takes over is because of those plutonium and americium and neptunium and curium, these man-made elements which are heavier than uranium and which are extraordinarily toxic in very small quantities. Now you'll notice that the blue line dips down until about 100,000 years after coming out of the reactor and then it goes back up a little bit again. That sounds strange, eh? How come it gets more toxic after a while? Well the reason is because, like I told you, these wastes are active. They are constantly changing. They're constantly disintegrating. And when a radioactive atom disintegrates, it literally changes into a new substance. How long does nuclear waste generate heat? Well, here is a picture of the four nuclear reactors at Fukushima Daiichi on the coast of Japan. It was, uh, it was almost four years ago. So, uh, yeah, almost four years ago. Three, about three and a half years ago now. It's going to be four years in March. Well. These reactors, you know, there was a giant earthquake and there was a tsunami and terrible, terrible devastation. Thousands of people, tens of thousands of people killed by the natural forces. Um, but the nuclear power plants survived this pretty well. They, even after the earthquake and after the tsunami, they were relatively undamaged. It was only a few days later that they started exploding. And it turns out that the reason they were exploding was not because of the nuclear reaction inside, not the nuclear fission reaction, because those reactors were safely shut down the moment the earthquake happened. Within a very short time, they were totally shut down. The fission reaction was completely stopped. But you can't shut off radioactivity. And it was the radioactivity that they could no longer cool because the tsunami had wiped out the electrical systems, and so the heat from the disintegrating atoms raised the temperature to 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And the cores of three of those reactors melted right down to the bottom of the reactor. And some of them may maybe melted right through into the ground below. Um, that's an amazing amount of damage caused by what? Nuclear fuel waste. Now, of course, nuclear fuel waste, which is older, is not going to be able to do this. But it just shows you and reminds you once again how extraordinarily powerful radioactivity can be. This is radioactivity that did this. And those explosions, those explosions were caused by chemical reactions caused by the radioactivity and the heat. The heat and the radioactivity combined created a lot of hydrogen gas. And that is what led to those gigantic explosions. Look at that damage. What's difficult to remind yourself is that that damage is self-inflicted damage. That's the damage that the reactor has done to itself because of the nuclear fuel waste inside that wasn't properly cooled. So if you don't look after nuclear waste, it becomes a problem. Uh, now, even years afterwards, they still have groundwater flowing under these plants and washing contaminated water into the ocean at the rate of about 300 tons a day. And they're trying to build a gigantic ice wall, a subterranean ice wall around the reactors to divert the groundwater to stop the flushing of the radioactive material into the sea. But there's something else going on. At the same time that this is happening, they are also deliberately pumping water down into the melted cores of those reactors and back up again in order to cool the fuel. Because the fuel has to be cooled for how long? longer than three and a half years. So they still have to pump 400 tons a day of water down into those melted cores to prevent them from overheating again. 
and releasing more radioactivity into the environment. That was me. Uh, but these are the tanks that they build, and they've built over 1,000 of them. They've built about 1,500 tanks, and they're building new tanks every day to accommodate this highly contaminated water, which is much too contaminated to release into the environment. But they're trying to get a certain leeway to cut some corners and be allowed to dump some of this water back into the ocean. Um, they have a system of trying to decontaminate the water, but what is in the water? What, what is in the water are the fission products that were flushed out of the fuel, you see, and only a small fraction of them. But they, ha they now have a system which is capable of filtering out or eliminating 62 different varieties of radionuclides. But the equipment breaks down frequently, it's not very reliable, and they're trying to build more such equipment. Meanwhile, the water keeps accumulating. They have about 200, I believe it's 180,000 tons of highly contaminated water uh, to deal with. And that water is so contaminated that even a puddle on the ground, you could get, if you stood, there was a certain puddle they had on the ground, this was reported in the news. If you stood an, uh, uh, one meter away from that puddle for one hour, you would get the same dose as an atomic worker's maximum exposure for five years. So it just shows you again, you know, uh, how incredibly dangerous this can become. So what is reprocessing and is it likely to happen? I mentioned about reprocessing. I believe it is likely to happen because uh, the nuclear industry uh, wants to survive. And if the nuclear industry wants to survive enough, they're going to have to want to use the plutonium sooner or later. Uh, there is no rush to do it, but every country that has a large investment in nuclear power outside of North America, Russia, England, France, India, Japan, all the countries that have invested heavily in nuclear power, they all have reprocessing plants. And they reprocess their spent fuels to get the plutonium out for civilian purposes as well as maybe for military purposes. And if you look in the internet, you'll find that the sites where these reprocessing plants are, Sellafield, Hanford, West Valley, USA, Mayak in Russia, and other ones in France, we have uh, the uh, La Hague. These are among the most radioactively contaminated sites on Earth. So uh, it's very difficult to take this solid spent fuel and dissolve it in acid without causing a lot of contamination. And so it's a nasty business. Now, this is a mural. They have a mural on the wall of the Saskatoon airport that was commissioned by Chemical Corporation, which is Canada's giant multinational uranium company, which also um, used to own part of Bruce Power, but I guess they're out of that now, I think, aren't they? I think they're out of Bruce Power, aren't they? Chemical, do you guys know? NWMO? Anyway, um, and what the mural says, the last panel, it's about the nuclear fuel cycle. How many people here have ever heard the phrase nuclear fuel cycle? Okay, a few. Well, the funny thing about a nuclear fuel cycle is that it suggests that it's, it goes around. But if you look at it, it's not a cycle unless you do reprocessing. The only way you can make it into a cycle is by reprocessing and recycling the plutonium. So, uh, and what they say on this mural in the Saskatoon airport is reprocessing and storage are the final stages of the nuclear fuel cycle. So there it is. It, you just have to read the writing on the wall. Um, and here it is. This is the mural. This is an amazing mural. It's just devoted to the nuclear industry all over the walls behind where people sit. And it shows the whole nuclear fuel chain from the mining of uranium all the way through to the final step, reprocessing and waste disposal. Jeremy Whitlock, who is a, a, a nuclear scientist at Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, Chalk River, on August 3rd, 2005, wrote, What's even more exciting is the prospect of recycling used nuclear fuel to extract some of the 99% remaining energy potential that it retains after leaving the reactor. The potential for future societies to elect to pursue this route has been entrenched in the proposed program of Canada's Nuclear Waste Management Organization. And indeed it has. Um, now, the NWMO people uh, have been told that this is not on the agenda, but of course, they're not the ones making the big decisions. Um, they're doing their job, and they're told what the job is. But uh, you can be sure, once this fuel gets moved to a centralized location, there's going to be a big push. Now, the reason I know this so well 
is because in 1977, I was one of the people testifying at the Royal Commission on Electric Power Planning in Toronto, the one that had that report, A Race Against Time. And I cross-examined nuclear experts at that occasion, on that occasion. <coughs> and some of these nuclear experts said that uh, they had no plans to reprocess used fuel, nuclear fuel. I was able to find, somebody sent it to me in a brown envelope, I was able to find that that was in the year 2000 and, um, excuse me, that was in the year 1987, 1977, 1977, woo, senior moment here. <laughs> in 1977, that very same year, there was a whole team of senior executives from Atomic Energy of Canada Limited giving a briefing to senior civil servants in Ottawa saying it is absolutely urgent that we get going on reprocessing right away. It's absolutely urgent. We're way behind. We've got to catch up with the other countries. We need funding immediately so as to begin to bring this project online. So they were saying two different things in two different venues. And this is why I have firsthand knowledge of the fact that what you hear is not always what you get. And uh, in fact, the Porter Commission was so interested in this discrepancy and the fact that the industry would undertake such a shameful uh, approach that they looked into it further and, and I was allowed to cross-examine witnesses more on the reprocessing option. And they came up with one of their major recommendations was that they said, we, the committee, the commission, we are opposed to the centralization of irradiated nuclear fuel because we think that such centralization would presuppose reprocessing. The only way that a community could have any partial assurance that reprocessing would not take place would be to have a law enacted saying that it is illegal to reprocess spent fuel in Canada. So if people are considering seriously about accepting used fuel for disposal, I think they owe it to their constituents, they owe it to their community, they owe it to their region and to the world to insist that the Government of Canada pass a law saying that this spent fuel will not be reprocessed. Um, oh well, I, I think I've, uh, I've really said enough. Uh, we've got a lot of, there's one thing I haven't said however and it's the graphics that I left out. Um, and that is that we've come to the conclusion, that when, when I say we, I mean me and many of my colleagues who work in Canada and in the United States. We have a Great Lakes coalition of uh, environmentalists uh, who specialize on nuclear questions. And uh, we feel that, uh, that the whole idea of geologic disposal is misguided at this point in time. Because for several reasons, it's really just a, a hope backed up with a lot of very expensive research that has been carried out. But no matter how much research you do, you really can't prove that this is going to be a safe way to go. You can't prove by any method known to science that if you put something in one point, point A, that it's never going to go to another point by itself, point B. Nature is the great recycler. You know, they found in the middle of the Sahara Desert, they found that the sand had DDT in it. Yet nobody, to their knowledge, had ever used DDT in the Sahara Desert. They found DDT in core bits that they drilled in the Greenland ice sheets. This stuff gets around. So um, we feel that it's a mistake to abandon this material. NWMO does not talk about abandoning it, but in fact, that is the intention. The intention is, sooner or later, 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, sooner or later they want to seal it up and walk away from it. And uh, I, I don't think that we're ready for that. I don't think that we know enough about it. I think that what we have to do is we have to keep this stuff under perpetual surveillance. We have to always keep an eye on it. We have to, and it, it, it's not hard to package it very well. They know how to package it very well. You can package it very well, even the NWMO itself in their first report that they submitted to the, Parliament, to the Government of Canada, details how they would handle that situation. You would just simply repackage the waste periodically. But you have to have a commitment to look after it properly. You have to have constant monitoring, constant. The advantage of this approach, which is called rolling stewardship, 
The advantage of rolling stewardship is that you don't have to look to the far distant future and whether some distant civilization will either uh, will even understand the language you speak, but you just have to talk to the next generation, and then they have to talk to the next generation, and they have to talk to the next generation. This idea was put forward by the National Academy of Sciences in a report of theirs, and anybody who wants further information on that or on any other aspect that I've talked about tonight, feel free to write me at my email address. It's ccnr at web ca ccnr at web.ca and if you drop me uh, an email and put something in the subject line uh, like uh, um, you know uh, nuclear waste or something of that sort to catch my attention I will answer your question and send you some resources if you want to get more information about it I also just want to finish by saying that I don't believe for one minute that I have a corner on the truth uh, I don't believe for one minute that the NWMO people uh, are doing anything but doing their job and doing it presumably well. And I don't think that anybody intends any harm. I don't think the nuclear industry wants to harm anybody. But you don't have to want to harm people to end up harming people. That's, that's the problem. And so you really have to be very, very careful. And the reason for the urgency in dealing with this nuclear waste, is it really because of immediate safety issues or is it because of the agenda of the nuclear industry. That's what you should ask yourself. Thank you very much.